say that today's talk will be um, a lot more technical in some sense. And if you haven't followed part one, um, yeah, you'll have to, it, 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 might, it might come out of nowhere. But the idea is to show how magnetohydrodynamics comes from this um, Euler Poincare reduction type technique in the same way that rigid body dynamics um, we did in part one came out of that uh, strategy. And so a quick recap, um, I argued last time that magneto incompressible ideal MHD, which is pretty much the single fluid model of a plasma inside of a uh, reactor, nuclear reactor, or maybe the plasma um, in interstellar media, um, solar flares and things like that. They can be crudely or maybe on a global time scale and length scale be uh, modeled by um, these two equations, ideal incompressible MHG. The first equation is the momentum equation for the bulk fluid. On the left hand side, you have the uh, well, the lead derivative or maybe the convective derivative of the velocity, Eulerian velocity field. And on the right hand side, you have this Lorentz force, the J cross B force, which is going to give you very different or maybe fun dynamics on top of the regular fluid motion. And this magnetic field is um, advected in a way and to accommodate for this advection or to inbuild this um, advection property, you have a second equation, uh, which is the induction equation, if you're thinking of Maxwell's equations. So the time derivative of B is equal to the curl of V cross B. And really what we should be thinking of, or at least drawing the analogy with um, the equations of a spinning top, where exactly, you know, like almost term by term, you have an exact replica of the time derivative of the angular velocity seen in the body frame, plus a omega cross I omega, which is the same thing as the V dot nabla V term. So the left-hand side is sort of the total derivative of the uh, velocity field. And on the right-hand side, you have a torque, or, um, which is the gravity pulling the center of mass um, when you have a, a spinning top, which is just displaced, or it's spinning around a fixed point that's not the center of mass, and therefore it's gonna have an additional talk uh, from that. And this gamma vector is the direction of gravity, not in the inertial frame, which is always pointing downwards, but it's the, gra the, the vector represented in the frame of the moving body. And to accommodate for this difference in reference frames, you need to advect, so to speak, the gravity direction, and therefore you have a second equation. Uh, down here, which plays the same role as the induction equation for MHD. And it comes really, it comes automatically or very nicely out of what is called Euler Poincare reduction, which is the um, thing I discussed or the, the machinery I discussed in the part one of the talk. So let's recap what were the ingredients for this to work. Um, you're trying to encapsulate the dynamics of a given system um, by using elements of a Lie group. And um, obviously you can't do this without this, without being able to come up with a group structure which characterizes different configurations for your dynamical system. And on top of this Lie group, you inherit or you make sure that you have a property uh, of your Riemannian metric um, that will have, that is for the rigid body dynamics, left invariance. And what that means is that if you take two vectors at some point G in your Lie group, say by differentiating two different curves that match at a specific uh, point on the Lie group seen as a manifold, and you pull these curve, these vectors back um, at the identity, so you left reduce them by taking the tangent map at G and 
you know, sort of Jacobian, using the Jacobian matrix to transfer them back to the identity. Well, if you use the inner product at G, given by your Riemannian metric, well, you get the same number as if you use the reduced vectors at the identity. And an inner product at the identity can be seen as a, a vector product, an inner product on a very special space called the Lie algebra. And it's often very useful or very convenient to work with things in the Lie algebra, most of it because it's a, Lie, uh, it's a vector space, and it's often uh, much simpler to write things down. But also it has a special operation, which is this Lie bracket, which is compatible with um, navigating along the group in a way that I'll demonstrate shortly. Um, and that's the key recipe for this Euler Poincare reduction is instead of trying to find the dynamics of curves on the group somewhere remote, you pull everything back and look at the dynamics of elements of the Lie algebra to pilot this action on the group. And hopefully by doing so, you've actually cut down the dimension of your dynamical system in by half, where you can treat um, the dynamics and Lie algebra as a first order system, and then try and solve for the consequence of having a time varying Lie element, Lie algebra element, on how that should map back forward onto the group. I'll show that in a second uh, in, in the next slide. There is this, um, we discussed the other time, the left action and its tangent map, which is uh, a bit of a, I mean, notationally, it's a bit, that's a lot of symbols for sort of a simple operation where you pull vectors back to the identity. And so I define this shortcut notation of H bullet V, the action of um, pushing forward the vector V to a new place at uh, H G through the left action. Right. Uh, we'll use this notation again a bit further down in the talk. Hopefully this is clear. And I'm defining an inner product with these double brackets in, on the Lie group to differentiate it with, to, uh, um, with the Riemannian metric on the manifold on the Lie group. Just a bit of notation. May, may I ask a question? Is it, please, please. Um, the, uh, is there any issue with the simply connectedness of the group with all of this procedure? Not here, no. Okay. But this is pretty general. Because, um, right, because Lie algebras are not... No, you're right. They're not necessarily connected. In fact, they're not even compact in some... Well, they're not even bounded in some cases. That's right. So, so you know, S, SU2 and SO3... Um, and, and so you just basically have to worry about, so if you solve your gyroscope locally, if you want to interpret physically what you've got, you need to do that carefully, I guess, is, is the answer. But as far as the dynamics and the algebra is concerned, it doesn't care. It, exactly. There is an obstacle, I guess, is um, how far you can solve for the, um, so given a vector in the Lie algebra, how far can you travel off the identity? Yeah, <laughs> that's the topic that yeah it, that can lead us to very deep su subjects. So, but I agree that. But if you're in the group, you, there's never a problem. By you're you're in the group, you're in the group. So the 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 tangent map, there's no issue in building the tangent map from anywhere in the group. The issue is how to connect curves which are too far or points which are too far apart. Yeah. Um, yeah, you might have issues there. This is what they call gimbal lock, right? With, with, where, where no, the gimbal lock is a problem. Well, yeah. gimbal lock is a problem of coordinates in some sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, not, it's not the problem of the group. It's a problem of the representation of the group, the local representation of the group with a, a set of coordinates which are singular um, on the uh, North Pole. And so your equations seem to go berserk. But as far as I can understand this phenomena, it has nothing to do with the group action. No, I, 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 I don't want to derail you, but hey, this is STG, so that's what happens. So um, okay. the, uh, the, the, if the coordinates degenerate in SO3, then it means you, you're, you're at, this, at this singular point. If you're in SU2, they're, they're, they're not. So, um, but so, but the, the, the singularities arise from your coordinate system, your choice of coordinate systems. 
Um, yeah. There's no. <laughs> I, I don't want to derail things. Yeah, Please. we can talk about that later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So with this um, nice invariance property, while you could do regular Euler-Lagrange type uh, variational principle based on a functional using the Riemannian metric on the group, namely you pick so you compute the energy associated to a curve uh, that goes from point G1 to point G2 by squaring, uh, taking the velocity square and integrating over that uh, curve. That gives you an energy functional. You could then vary those curves by introducing a second parameter, maybe epsilon, and you have a family, a two parameter family of curves on the group. And you find the, the curve such that the variations of the energy functional are stationary. And in that case, you'll find uh, that the, the solution curve actually is a geodesic on the group. And um, by doing the standard variational calculus, you'll find Euler-Lagrange equations for the G dot, of, sorry, for the G of T. So you'll get second order G dot dot equals something as a resulting um, equation of motion. That's fine, there's nothing wrong about that, and you can always do that, there's no issues here. It's more general in some sense because it doesn't, the, the group, the, the manifold doesn't have to be Lie group. However, when you have this left invariance, it's a smart thing to record the value of the functional, not on the group, but in the Lie algebra, which now becomes uh, where you could use your inner product on a vector space, and integrate over time just the variation of these V, not the variation, but, but a curve in the Lie algebra, such that the correct dynamics, the push forward uh, dyna dynamics draws the geodesics. And if you do that, you have to perform a constrained um, variational principle where because you're basing these Vs, which are part of the Lie algebra, uh, on the, um, it's a, it's a left reduced vector. It has this, this structure of being G minus one bullet G dot. And your variations now in your Lie algebra will be a W say, which is now G minus one bullet of the epsilon derivative of G. These things are constrained in some way because they're based on the same G uh, two par parameter family of G's. And so you can't insert any variation you want in the um, reduced energy functional. You'll have to respect what is called the Lin constraint, which is that the derivative with respect to epsilon of your V um, Lie element is in fact the time derivative of your uh, reduced variation plus the Lie bracket between V and W. It's a remarkable thing, and I'll prove that in the next slide, just because I think it's nice enough to um, show. And in this case, you'll obtain, um, after performing that variational uh, problem, a first order equation for the Vs, which don't depend on where you are because you lie on the identity at all time. So you can solve that independently from solving the curve, the, the, the actual curve, which is obtained by, in fact, solving a second, at a, at a second stage, the, this equation here, which is how you obtain your uh, reduced V in the first place. So G dot is actually G bullet V, and you have to solve that equation at some point in order to recover the G. This is never done in practice because uh, either it's a bit tedious, but it's more of a kinematic type um, equation rather than a dynamical thing. So all the dynamics lies in the first part. So effectively, you reduced your dynamics to looking at things in the Lie algebra first, and then sort of um, evaluating the consequence of that curve in the Lie algebra at a later stage. And that's where the, it's, this technique is, is useful. You, just, you cut things in half, so to speak. Now, what are those Lint constraints? And I've had a couple of emails asking me why we need to respect this thing. 
And I think there's a very easy way to do it in, if we um, assume that we have a matrix Lie group. Uh, at least we can show that very quickly if we do that. So the first thing, again, is to remember that V is a um, left reduction of some variation of the G curve. So we wrote it as G minus one bullet the time derivative of G, so the tangent vector along the curve in G. And we also wrote W to be the same thing, but where we vary with respect to our epsilon parameter. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's based on the same um, underlying two parameter family of curves in the group. And we have to respect this structure, otherwise uh, it doesn't make any sense to uh, vary the action without this thing being um, uh, you know, kept in the um, <laughs> derivation. Notice that this guy, which is a variation uh, of the curve, this one is arbitrary. And they, de facto, the W element is also arbitrary. So the arbitrary thing is our W and the V is a consequence. Um, of the left reduction. So for matrix groups, for example, in SO3, and that's what we did last time, we had a two parameter family of rotation matrices, and we deduced the um, uh, angular velocity vector or, or um, anti-symmetric matrix as being R to the minus one seen as a matrix operating or matrix multiplying the time derivative of our two parameter family of uh, rotation matrices. The bullet here becomes a much simpler operation. It's just matrix multiplication. And I think we also defined an eta matrix, which is R to the minus one matrix multiplying the epsilon derivative of our rotation matrix. And I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna stick this so my plan is to stick this guy here, differentiate with respect to epsilon, stick this guy here, differentiate with respect to time, and check that I get the Lie bracket of omega and eta. Before I do that, I just need to do a little bit of logistics. So, and this is to answer Joffrey's question by email. For sure, if I differentiate with respect to any of my parameters, this can be, you know, T or epsilon, the product of R to the minus one and R, well, I'll get zero because R to the minus one R is actually the identity matrix, right? So the identity matrix doesn't depend on any of my parameters. But this is nice because I can use a product rule to compute the derivative with respect to epsilon or T of my inverse um, rotation matrix. So that's the first term. Um, just write it out in, as a function of the, or in terms of the variation of R because the sum of them has to be zero. That means that my derivative of my inverse matrix is minus R to the minus one d of r, r to the minus one. And I'm gonna use that when I differentiate omega and eta with respect to various parameters. Uh, just gonna substitute that thing in. So let's do that. If I differentiate omega with respect to epsilon, I'm going to get a epsilon derivative of my r to the minus one thing, plus, r to the minus one of a second derivative with respect to epsilon and t of my r matrix. And if I do exactly the same, but on eta and differentiate with respect to um, uh, t this time, I'll get a very similar expression, except that the symbols are flipped. <laughs> I'll have a t derivative of my r to the minus one matrix and an epsilon, uh, sorry, uh, times the epsilon derivative of r, plus again a square term, uh, sorry, a second order derivative 
of R with respect to epsilon and T. And they commute by Clairol's theorem. Um, now I can just substitute, so this, use this property here and here, and I'll have minus R to the minus one, the epsilon R, R to the minus one, the TR, looks like a mouthful, but we'll see some structure rise, plus this uh, second um, order thingy. And on the bottom line, I have exactly the same, but with the symbols flipped, which is this guy, plus exactly the same term there. Now, if I take a difference, their difference, right? If I take this one minus the second guy, that term's just gonna drop out. So the second derivatives don't appear at all. And then it's just a matter of identifying this guy, which is actually an eta, right? That's the definition of eta. And this guy is the definition of omega and vice versa. So I have a, here an omega and here an eta. <laughs> so that, as a consequence, the epsilon derivative of omega minus the time derivative of eta is actually omega eta minus eta omega, which is the commutation, um, the matrix commutation between these two uh, elements of the Lie algebra. And that's the sort of origin of the uh, Lin constraints, at least in the case of Lie groups, matrix Lie groups. And there's not much more to that um, when you have more general structures, group structures. Um, I'm thinking of the tangent maps of uh, left actions or right actions thingies. There's, it's not harder than that. It's just more, a bit more, um, yeah, you have to be a bit more formal here and there. Okay, so that's a explanation of the Lin constraints. Now let's try and focus on fluid motion and trying to get towards ideal MHD at some point. And I'm, first of all, what I'd like to do is to demonstrate or, or maybe justify the fact that fluid, uh, uh, the motion of a fluid can be described by an element of the group of diffeomorphism. And well, if you picture a, a body of fluid, say living or, or contained within a domain M. So M can be a manifold, or just a domain in R3 or whatever you want. And it's gonna be a fixed thing. And within, it, within this domain, all your fluid particles are gonna travel, travel around in some random way if you want. But you expect from say physical considerations, I guess, that you can trace out the individual motion of these fluid elements. In particular, if I start off at X zero, I have a feeling that I should be able to trace out a curve in time um, so that a little later this fluid element will sit at a position of x and maybe you have a time parameter that you want to you know, start the clock and try and follow it. Um, it, will, it will arrive to a later position x of t and you can differentiate at every point in time, that curve that this fluid element traces out to give you a vector in M. Now you can start varying at zero a little bit, or maybe a lot, and you can repeat this process. So you could, you could do this thing on the, on the dotted line or the dashed line here and, and start to trace out all the particle trajectories of your fluid. Effectively, what you're doing is you're reconstructing the map from the initial labels or the initial positions of your fluid particles down further in time um, at a later time. And so effectively you're creating a map, and let me call that map phi of t between m and m. So you're creating a, a, yeah, a map and that map depends on time. And you sort of expect from physics, I guess, from physical considerations that this map is differentiable 
in the sense that if you take points very close by, arbitrarily close by, further down the line, these two points will be reasonably within the same neighborhood. And maybe you have some way of controlling that using epsilons and deltas, whatever. So you have continuity, you have that map, which is continuous. And then you also expect that if you recorded the thing backwards, you could trace out the inverse. So you expect at least that this map is bijective, continuous, and has a continuous inverse. And in fact, why not ask this to be smooth, so C infinity uh, map between M and M with a smooth inverse, which is the definition for a diffeomorphism. So we're, we're, we're studying, or we we're trying to picture fluid motion as being an element or a time, uh, a curve, a, a, pr a family of uh, points, elements of the diffeomorphism group. And when I mean group, I mean group by composition. So the group operation between two diffeomorphisms is just given by the apply the map first and then apply the second map. Um, okay. Now, notice that when I differentiate phi with respect to t, I get a map which goes sideways, so to speak, in the sense that if I take a point x0 and I push it through that map, I'll get a point which is at xt somewhere else on m. And um, this is not technically a vector field, it's called a lift, uh, where you sort of take a point x0, you differentiate that map with respect to time, and you land with a vector x dot, which is not at the point you started. Um, so it's, it goes sideways, <laughs> so to speak. It's, it's not a vector field, but we'll get there eventually. We'll try and produce a vector field out of this. And before we do that, we, there is something in fluids, I guess, this is my personal opinion, but people may have a different opinion, but it feels natural to inbuild uh, the notion of relabeling symmetry at this stage of the um, setting, where from physical considerations, the fact that I noted the label, the, the, the fluid element with an X zero, is totally irrelevant to the position it's going to take at a later time. In some sense, if I put dye or color, coloring, if I started coloring each fluid elements, the actual color I give to those fluid elements doesn't matter at all. I can start reshuffling the colors in every possible way. As long as I keep track of individual colors, I will respect the dynamics, but the coloring is not particularly useful to or it's not going to affect how the particle evolves in time. So the fluid label is irrelevant to the dynamics, which means that I can start reshuffling all my fluid labels, which means acting with um, pre-composing with a diffeomorphism before doing anything. And that, unfortunately, <laughs> goes with, uh, well, it, it leans towards what is called right invariance of the theory. And that's to be contrasted with what we did last time, where we had a rigid body, um, which is moving in real space. And the point of that physical system was that it doesn't matter how you orientate your inertial frame. Uh, so the orientation of the inertial frame is irrelevant, but that's a post operation. It's post composition of a matrix element after you've solve the dynamics, so to speak. And that led, or at least comes in hand with um, left invariance. So there's a bit of chirality <laughs> uh, when we try and uh, apply Euler Poincare to fluid dynamics and with respect to Euler Poincare in rigid body dynamics. And I think there's a clean, well, there's a physical reason for that. Uh, at least I, I tried to justify that physically. So, so there's, there's it, fluids are chiral brothers of rigid bodies, if, so, if you allow me this analogy. So once I've decided that um, instead of using a left action, I should use a right action, namely, I define pre-composition -comp, pre with theta 
to be a map from the group on itself. Then I should produce uh, the right, uh, the, the tangent map of this action on the group in the same way that I needed to construct the tangent map of the left action. Now, things are nice because the only thing I need to consider, so if I need to compute the derivative of that right action map at a point phi of t, acting on a vector of the tangent uh, space of the group at phi, there's a shortcut to do this, or at least we could define it this way. It's the time derivative of the uh, right action of theta. Oh, it's the time derivative of this thing. And I do insist in putting the theta inside the, um, the, the, the parentheses here because this makes sense to differentiate on a group, um, but I would not know how to take the theta, well, actually in this case, it is exactly what's going to happen. This is the same as differentiating the phi map and precomposing the theta, but in general, it might not be the case. It's a special case here of, uh, that comes from the composition law. What's nice about this right action or this uh, tangent map right tangent map, is that you don't lose order, you don't lose um, the differentiability of phi because you're just taking t derivatives of the thing on the, on the yeah. left. If you, if you wanted to do right, in, right action on the diffeomorphism group, you would have to differentiate the phi map first and then take the derivative. And if you do that uh, more uh, globally, you would lose uh, a derivative in the process. So it turns out to be quite nice. And once you've defined the tangent map, so, so yeah, this is our bullet operation um, in two slides ago, but it's on the right instead of the left. And now if we want to replicate the left reduction we did for rigid body dynamics, here we have a right reduction instead and we would do it in the natural way. We um, um, pre-multiply, I guess, or pre-compose with the inverse of the map in exactly the same way that we post-compose with the inverse of the map acting on an element of the tangent space. So we have this chirality here in defining the right reduction for fluids. And maybe let's draw what, what this diagram, let's complete this diagram with this right reduction um, to explain or to justify that this is nothing else, the right reduction thingy that I'm talking about is nothing else than the Eulerian velocity field of the fluid. So indeed, if I map points from M to M through 5T, the time derivative of 5T is a sideways lift but if I pre-compose with phi t to the minus one, I'm actually going left first and then up in a way that it commutes with the notion of going straight up from the manifold to the tangent bundle, which is the definition for a vector field. So V of t, the Eulerian velocity field, which is the right reduction uh, in the diffeomorphism group, is a vector field, a proper vector field on M. So we might as well just write this down as um, the space of vector fields is the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group, which is a remarkable thing. So space of uh, vector fields is um, the algebra. And we know how to deal with uh, vector fields. We have a full range of operations we could apply to vector fields. We can differentiate them. We can take Lie brackets of them and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, what I mean by Eulerian velocity field, it's the, it's the velocity vector attached to the trajectory of each fluid elements in the sense that 
when you solve for those trajectories, you're solving the ODE x dot of t is equal to v of t x of t. So you're, you're mapping, you're following the curves that satisfy uh, this first order ODE and existence and uniqueness of these things is, is, is well understood. Um, and nicely, I guess, or neatly, it makes sense to model the Lie bracket on the group, the Lie, uh, the, uh, Lie algebra, and I noted this pedantically as a scripture diff of M, this doesn't exist, this is not a notation that exists, but it's to make a difference between the Lie algebra of a group in an abstract sense and the space of vector fields, which has a Lie bracket. Namely, it makes sense to identify the Lie bracket on diff as the Lie bracket of vector fields. Uh, I'm, I'm making a big story out of, well, I'm making a lot of uh, out of this, but there is a, a subtle difference between the two operations and we are really identifying this here. Now the Lie bracket of vector fields in local coordinates is a very standard operation, I guess. It's the derivative, it's the tangent, uh, it's the derivative of the W vector field in the direction of V written here in uh, Cartesian local coordinates minus the opposite, so the derivative of V in the direction of W. Um, let me, oh, and I forget, I forget to mention that if we wanted to build this little diagram for the case of um, um, rigid body dynamics, we would have this thing where we are mapping the body frame into the inertial frame using this rotation matrix. And R dot gives you a sideways map in the same sense that the time derivative of the diffeomorphism give you a lift. But what we're trying to do through Euler Poincare reduction is express everything in the body frame. So we're actually mapping backwards um, up here when we express omega as being r to the minus one times r dot. So omega is actually a vector field on the Euclidean space, but on the body frame and not in inertial frame. Whereas the fluid, the Eulerian velocity field is a vector field on the inertial frame, um, if you want to see it this way. So it's, it's, it's a funny chirality here that we have between the two systems. Um, okay. Now, someone also asked what on earth is this Lie bracket for vector fields? And I think it's, this is a parenthesis in some sense. Um, just to explain from a geometrical point of view what this Lie bracket of vector fields is trying to convey. And it's useful to go just through two steps. The first one is to uh, define what are integral curves of vector fields. So pick a vector field, which is just an attribution of a little vector on a manifold. So if your manifold is a potato or donut, whatever, at every point you give a little vector and you start populating this um, manifold with little hair. Um, <laughs> and you're trying to solve the ODE, um, uh, the, the following ODE by, um, so the, the integral curve respects this ODE with the velocity vector in M along that curve matches exactly the direction of the vector field. That's the ODE you're solving. It's, it's different in some sense than the ODE. Well, it's a little different from this ODE. Where you, and the only difference is that the Eulerian velocity field might depend on time. Whereas the integral curve of a vector field, the vector field is fixed. It has no time dependence. And you're just trying to trace out the field lines that come from that vector field. So it's, the integral curves are slightly different in that sense. And once you've um, solved 
for these integral curves for any point, um, uh, uh, um, initial point x0, well, you can construct what is called the flow of a vector field, namely, it's a diffeomorphism from the group onto itself, where you're mapping initial points down the integral curves of x uh, for some time or some parameter s. The nice thing about this construction is that this corresponds to one parameter subgroup of the diffeomorphism group. And you have this nice composition or, or nice, uh, I think it's called a homomorphism between the real line and the, this subgroup where composition of the same, the, the, the flow map of the same vector is the same as just following the particle for the total duration of the, the, the time-like parameter. Now, what you can do with these flows is to say you had two vector fields, x and y, and you'd be able to compute the flows of these two vector fields. So maybe let's draw a picture. You have vector field red, which is x, vector field blue. Oh, this is terrible drawing of vector field, but these guys are flat vectors. Y, and say you would be able to compute the flows. Now it turns out, that the Lie bracket is trying to measure the non-commutation of these two flows in the following sense. If you start from a point x and you travel um, along the flow of x, so let's say we go along the flow of x for a time-like parameter t, you arrive at some point x of t, and then you travel exactly, or you, you travel down the flow of y for some time parameter s. So green is the flow of x and purple is the flow of y. Well, if you did the exactly the opposite operation where you first flow along y first, for the same amount of time s and then flow along this, uh, the, the, the vector field x, well, it turns out that in most cases, there'll be a small difference. You'll not end up at the same spot on your manifold. And this small difference, if you could represent this as a vector, so namely in local charts, you would have to do that. You could look at it and maybe take the limit of these s and t parameters going to zero. And the Lie bracket is exactly the term, the non, the, the lowest order term of this uh, uh, operation. So it's the same as taking the limit of this guy. So the top piece is my delta of s and t. And that's what the bracket is conveying. So it's a very nice way of computing the bracket is a very nice way of measuring non-commutation of flows. That's its sole purpose in some sense. It's a very geometric thing, so it shouldn't, yeah. Okay, <laughs> hopefully you're hanging in there. I, I can't see you because I have my screens on different things, but hopefully you're hanging there. Um, I think now we should produce fluid equations based on this uh, machinery. And um, again, the first person and maybe the, the, the most satisfying piece of um, most satisfying paper to read is by Arnold, uh, 1966, where he recognized that fluid equations, the incompressible fluid equations, are instances of this procedure. Um, and it's surprisingly, you know, you, you do something naive and it turns out to be the correct thing. Namely, you equip the Lie algebra, which is the space of vector fields. And in particular, you take the component, which is actually the space of divergence free vector fields. Uh, the reason why you, do, you wanna do that is you want to look at diffeomorphisms that are a bit special, they're volume preserving. So the divergence free condition gives you um, uh, the nice result that the corresponding 
uh, vector field, uh, sorry, the corresponding diffeomorphism that produces these divergence free vector fields from the right reduction are volume preserving. Um, and you equip this Lie algebra with a very natural thing, the L2 inner product. So take vector V, take vector W dot product them using the Euclidean metric, integrate that whole thing over the, the, the volume, and that gives you an inner product uh, on that space. Well, geodesics on this volume preserving diffeomorphism group are um, uh, finding those geodesics will give you fluid equations. And we'll do this via the constrained variational problem where the reduced action is simply one half of the, dot, the inner product in the Lie algebra. You vary this thing by symmetry of the inner product, you'll get V multiplying a variation of V now you can't stick in anything, you, you must put in variations which look like this, which have the time derivative of W plus the Lie bracket of V and W. And you try and set this to zero. Now, how much time do I have? Yeah, I have a, don't have much time. Let me, let, me, let me give you the first step, and you can do this in your spare time, I guess. You, you just unfold this part, and you keep working through the algebra. So the first step is just to put v dot w, it's a double integral, integral over time, integral over the manifold. That's just uh, the first term, multiplying by the volume form, and then you have another double integral, t1, t2, over the manifold of v dot, the Lie bracket between V and W. Now it's, it might be useful to use local coordinates for this calculation, although you can do that in general. Just expand out the Lie bracket. So W nabla V over the volume form. You use all the vector calculus identities you can find on Wikipedia to try and re-express these things in terms of curls and things and whatnot. In fact, that thing is exactly the curl of V cross W if you have divergence free fields. You use uh, another identity to try and apply this W, the, 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 the curl operator on the V and you keep doing that, keep doing integration by parts. And at the end of the day, I do want to show this, otherwise it will not make much sense when you do it yourself. You'll have something that looks like V dot plus V dot grad V minus a half of uh, the gradient of V square. W for all times and for all, so integrated over the time thingy. And that thing has to be zero. There's a minus sign, overall minus sign. For all W's in divergence free vector fields. That's your uh, weak statement of your um, Euler Poincare equations. Now, remember that the space of divergence free vector fields is sort of orthogonal to gradients. In fact, this is called Helmholtz theorem. The space of uh, vector fields can be um, decomposed orthogonally with, by, by having elements of x zero and the space of gradients. And I'll put a P here because <laughs> I'm gonna try and justify having pressure uh, at the end of the day. So what it means that if this thing is orthogonal to vectors that are not gradients, that term, I could not care less about it. It has to be zero. So I'm left with this, just this part. And if that part must be orthogonal to everything except for gradients, well, it must be that there is a gradient. There might be a gradient, which it is equal to. 
and I might as well just put it in as like this. I'm using a lot of shortcuts here and I hope this is, this doesn't come out of nowhere, but it's because of the weak form or the weak formulation that you obtain an additional gradient uh, of uh, P, at least from the point of view of, um, um, yeah, the, the, from the point of view of the weak formulation, that's what you, that, that gradient of pressure is in fact a projection, a, a, a thing that insists on making the left-hand side divergence free. Actually, uh, has, have no divergence, that's what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion, but this is, yeah, there's no easy, clean route. You just have to go through the algebra step after step to see this. Okay, now I do want to conclude because this is going to drag on forever. There is a way to build in ideal MHD. I'll skip over that. The idea is the trick is to use semi-direct products instead of regular group operations. It's very beautiful, but uh, you can go and read it uh, through, um, Dar uh, there's a paper by Holm, Rasu, Marston that deals with that. And allow me to conclude or summarize by saying that fluid equations in general, there's this nice framework to generate them through this Euler Poincare reduction technique, where instead of um, using a standard variational problem on the group of diffeomorphism, you use a constrained variational problem where you insert these special variations or these Lin constraints. And it gives you a nice interpretation of these uh, fluid um, equations, dynamical equations. In particular, and I repeat this statement from last time, the Eulerian fluid velocity is actually the right reduction of the curve in diff M. So it's not exactly a configuration space variable if you're trying to do some more fancy things. Um, it's actually an induced variable. Right invariance is relabeling symmetry. And we could discuss a bit more about that. But I, I think it should be seen as a structural property, not as a consequence of the dynamics. We discussed Lie brackets in the sense of non-commutation of flows, and it's, it's a very nice um, geometric interpretation. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to present uh, semi-direct products, so this last bullet um, is missed. But it would be nice to continue and discuss conservation laws, Noether theorems, which is typically what would come out of a regular Euler-Lagrange type analysis. How do you embed that? within the Euler Poincaré framework. And there's a very nice thing called the um, Kev kelvin noether theorem or the momentum map and so on and so forth. So there's, it's, it's infinite subject, uh, many more <laughs> uh, talks about this, I guess, but allow me to advertise and, and you know, give the torch to someone else by saying or, or, or yeah, just summarizing some of the research activities that we're doing within the framework of say ideal MHD and extensions. In particular, one really interesting question that comes out of all this mess is what are the points of equilibrium of the dynamical systems of MHD? So what are MHD equilibrium? And there are fundamental questions that come with it. In particular, and I've, I mentioned that in the first part of the talk, the existence of flux surfaces, so the existence of foliations of the manifold under the flow of, say, your Eulerian field or maybe your magnetic field. This is still ongoing work, and I think this is essentially the, so the, the, the goal of the Millen Millennium Prize. I mean, uh, I don't think they've proved... Um, yeah, it has connections to the Millennium Prize. <laughs> we heard Bob Dewar talk about the idea of circumventing the MHD problem, but replacing it with a so-called multi-region relaxed MHD uh, thing. And I refer you to this link on YouTube, which is actually part of this series of talks. There's um, the ANU and it's uh, uh, the group at ANU is 
world leader in stellarator optimization, which means shaping the boundary or the coils around a plasma um, in order to tailor the magnetic field in such a way that you get nice properties. Um, and I encourage you maybe, you know, someone who would be very, um, uh, would be able to talk about this and in particular focus on Poincaré maps of magnetic fields, how to control the size of magnetic islands, the dynamics of magnetic islands, Green's residue theorem and so on. That's Chu Song Ku, which I think is on the call. Um, the other question that comes right out of MHD is, and also the equilibrium problem is stability. So if you find an equilibrium, how stable is it with respect to small perturbations? So linear stability analysis, but also from a, not, uh, from a more general case, what happens to a system non-linearly? And hopefully you get nice, um, well, you don't get your plasma to blow out at infinity. Uh, it stays still and there's some form of saturation mechanism if it's unstable at some point, which is closely related to the notion of relaxation. And there's an ongoing discussion on what it means to have states with relaxed plasma, but maybe ideal interfaces. And if you try to do that, you will quickly end up having to use infinite current um, uh, densities and so on, singularities. And someone who would be capable of, uh, would be welcome to talk about is uh, Adele Wright, uh, also a student of ANU. Finally, off of this naturally comes the work on kinetic theory. How do you go beyond the fluid model? How do you put in particle transport, so neoclassical transport, wave particle interactions, and so on. Now, that's pretty much the whole subject, or the whole work of uh, Matthew Hall and his group at ANU. So I'll stop here. I've gone a little bit over time, and I apologize for this, but um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of material to be discussed, and it's very exciting for me to talk about it. So thanks for your attention.